just this way. Good afternoon, everyone. You must be so tired already. We're at the tail end of this two-day conference, so allow me to put a period to at least this group here as we uh, wrap up everything. Uh, my paper is Popularizing a Mindanaoan Cultural Landscape. It's a very different title from what is uh, printed there in the program. When I first got the first design, I was supposed to have a full hour, and that's why I prepared my talk and my PowerPoint to suit uh, what would have been an hour of talk and question and answer. But uh, when I arrived here, uh, because the communication uh, had already been, uh, I had left already, and no internet connection, so that's when I realized it's been shortened. So uh, allow me to still use my PowerPoint, but along the way I'll go very quickly so that I will not go behind time. Okay. Well, uh, following uh, the speech or the talk of uh, Carlito the Junior, here is now Carlito the Senior. <laughs> And following also on Pam, uh, there will be some interfacing uh, in terms of her own experience as a researcher in this particular field. Before the dawn of the Spanish colonial eras in the Philippines, excuse me. The indigenous, also known in Mindanao as Lumad, and the Moro peoples of Mindanao had a rich cultural tapestry, manifested uh, through material culture and cultural practices in the fields of theater, epic chanting, storytelling, and dancing, revolving around specially rites of passages. Our ancestors in Mindanao evolved a cultural landscape comparable to that of our neighbors in Southeast Asia. And there have been a lot of ethnographic studies around here, and there's also been, as a result of that, an upsurge of interest in this particular field. The chanting of epics was a major part of the life of our indigenous cultures long before the colonizers' occupation of the islands. Being mostly of the oral tradition, a few of these have been lost to the vagaries of time and could no longer be retrieved, but we're so lucky that a number of them could still be retrieved until today. The best example is, of course, the Darangin, which predated the entry of Islam to the Philippines in an ancient folk epic of the Maranao. There is also the whole collection of Lumad epics, uh, and this was mentioned by Una Paredes this morning in her keynote, uh, the chief of which is the Ola Hingan, sometimes also referred to as the Ola Nihen. And it has an outreach that includes uh, the Higaunons of Northeastern Bukidnon, Anagusan, the Bukidnons themselves, the Leanon Manobo, and the Obo Manobo. But uh, apart from the epic chanters, there were also storytellers. And today we are lucky to have access to the English translations of these stories. There are other aesthetic practices, proverbs, ritual, ritual boasts, myths, and other forms of verbal art, as well as songs that have survived through the past centuries, which collectively show the need to be grounded in a native literary tradition that can serve as the crucial foundation for a national literature. As rites and passages, rites of passages and religious rituals constitute the heart of the people's indigenous belief system around which their aspirations, hopes, and dreams are anchored, these tend to involve elaborate preparations as well as celebrations. As was already presented in a number of papers, there's a very rich, complex set of symbols in all of this. And there are a number of examples in many of the indigenous uh, communities across Mindanao. Because Islam had penetrated Mindanao much earlier than Christianity, most of the communities reached first by those who introduced this faith embraced Islam, which spread across the territories dominated by the Maguindanao 
Sulu, Buayan, Sultanates, and the Lanao Principalities. These communities resisted Spanish hegemony in some cases, which were violent armed resistance. And of course, uh, through uh, some of the papers we have already heard, a, a lot of uh, discussion has also been in terms of the Spanish entry and occupation that had impact on the people's cultures. This gradual process of culture change worsened during, of course, the American occupation in Mindanao. We saw the onslaught upon waves and waves of migrant settlers from the north who had already earlier discarded most of their indigenous roots through the 400 years of almost of, of the Spanish occupation. As they slowly embraced the cultural ways of the migrant settlers, including the Christian faith, the indigenous people, especially the Lumads, began to discard their own, even as some of them continued to hold on to bits and pieces of their indigenous roots, especially in terms of language and agricultural rituals. Thus began the process of giving up some of these age-old practices. From the autumn years of the American occupation to the first decades of the Republic, there began a strong push towards the Filipino's acculturation to American culture, facilitated by the introduction of the public school system and the entry of mass media communication systems. English became the main medium of instruction in schools, as textbooks were mainly in this language and teachers' training were primarily conducted in English. However, in the 1930s to the 1950s, there were an upsurge of militant cultural productions in the field of theater, literature, and songs, fueled by a very strong nationalist sentiment by the likes of Amado Hernandez, Lupe Santos, Jose Corazon de Jesus, Atang de Lerma, de Lerama, and others. There were also stirrings even in the field of the early films in the 1930s. However, in the same period, the country was introduced to Broadway theater stage plays through the westernized education that was provided in mostly private schools for privileged children, along with Shakespearean comedies and tragedies, as well as Western classics, performed in their English versions. Things began to change during the early part of the Marcos presidency at the, in the 1960s, swept by the global movement of youth's awakening awareness and militant response to social issues, Filipino students and artists began to revisit their historical and cultural roots to seek inspiration in the radical shift of their engagements. Student activists and cultural workers drawn to the national cause espousing an anti-American rhetoric labeled as colonial mentality opted for what they considered Filipino arising out of most campuses and artist circles in Metro Manila, this movement spread to at least some of the urban centers in Mindanao, like Davao, Cagayan de Oro, Iligan, and Butuan. When the late Ferdinand Marcos declared martial law in 1972, one of the major unintended consequences of his authoritarian regime was the flowering of a nationalist-oriented militant expression of popular culture from theater to songwriting, from poetry to visual arts. As student activists and cultural workers committed themselves to the task of conscientizing the masses, they explored all the various art forms to convince them to take part in the National Liberation Movement. Songwriters began to write songs mostly in Filipino which swept across campuses and the ranks of the militant people's organizations as they were sung in rallies, demonstrations, labor picket lines, and soon even heard over the radio and even got incorporated into some of the militant movies. In Mindanao, the group of Asin made inroads with their songs on social and ecological issues using a number of indigenous instruments. In Davao City, uh, we had 
uh, the Lumad music uh, being influenced uh, into the music of Joey Ayala, Bayang Barrios, the Bagong Lumad, and so on. Eventually, we also have indigenous persons themselves, like Wawai Sawai, Kokoy Pandian, and even earlier we had Garlito here, who began to write their songs in their own indigenous languages. Activists and political prisoners began also to write songs, and uh, visual artists also championed social realism, depicting the social ills of the Mindanao society, as they had done it also in Metro Manila, in Cebu, and in Negros. But it was a theater, uh, the mounting of theatrical productions where Mindanao's popular culture really soared. And there were four streams that began to emerge. One, one was inspired by the activist groups whose marches and rallies in the streets combined fiery speeches with street theater. These were short productions which combined militant songs and poems, both retrieved from parts uh, of poems uh, written by poets of earlier nationalist eras or contemporary ones. The second stream was pioneered by the Philippine Educational Theater Association, or PETA. For a while, PETA's main preoccupation centered in Metro Manila with its programs in developing a nationalist theater company, mounting mainly plays in Filipino written by local playwrights or even translated from Western sources, as they also made inroads into television like the Balintatao and training programs for actors, playwrights, and directors. As it envisioned to be a national theater movement, PETA began reaching out to the provinces. Its first workshop involved a church-related social action center based in Tagum, which is now part of Dabao del Norte. This workshop led to the organizing of community-based theater in this locality, who were producing mainly locally written plays in Cebuano or Visaya. The third stream, was promoted by churches both Catholic and Protestant, and the first one to venture into this was Father Don Galinzoga, who founded the Columbugan Dance Theater Group in Lanao del Norte, and he mounted plays like the Maranata. Added to this was the experience of the Mindanao Sulu Pastoral Conference Secretariat that uh, was able to develop a Mindanao-wide network of community-based uh, theater groups who mounted everything from Dula to La to Sarsuela, and had networks that involved uh, various groups. And the fourth stream uh, was this movement that began in Marawi City with the entry of Frank ne Rivera, initiated by the Mindanao State University's Academic uh, Affairs, an offshoot of PETA's Integrated Theater Arts Workshop in 1974. It involved Rivera and his early uh, group of artists who tapped into the richness of the Maranao culture came up with a play called Mga Kwentong Maranao featuring Pilandok, uh, a local trickster uh, which is already now a Mindanaoan theater complex. There until today, Sining Kambayoka in MSU is still very active. The other one who promoted this is Nestor Horfilia, uh, based in Davao, and who founded the Kaliwa Theater Collective. They produced a number of theatrical productions that tapped into the rich cultural traditions of the Lumad peoples like Sinalimba or Yaorakan. Along this line also, his team of cultural workers immersed themselves among the Manovos of Arakan Valley, the Tibolis of South Cotabato, the Zobano of Zamboanga, listen to their myths and historical narratives, learn their dances and music, and produce unique musical plays that also at the same time expose the reasons why uh, there is the disenfranchisement and the marginalization of the Lumans. Today, uh, the Kulturang Atin, uh, the Katara and, and other groups 
as uh, they have all followed uh, the example of Galiwat, and a good, still a few, num a few of them are still very active. Although uh, quite a number are still very much uh, university-based. There was even a, a group of all women called Bibuyan, and today uh, they're, a, they're a bit dispersed, but every now and then they have, they have reunion performances. In the field of visual arts, Bert Monterona, Anoyat Katige, Abraham Garcia began the trend of producing paintings, appropriating the images, symbols, colors of the Moro and the Lumad peoples. Today, there are quite a number of visual artists who are mounting exhibits, exhibits showing works following this trend, including Kublai Milan, John Kayas, Boots, Dumilao, Dumlao, and others. So we can say that uh, Mindanaoan visual aesthetic has started to arise and this had attracted now buyers from Metro Manila and abroad. And all this arose as activists and cultural workers of Mindanao began to uh, equate Filipino with being indigenous because most of the unique Moran Lumad cultures are still very prevalent across Mindanao compared to other parts of the country. Lately, there has been also areas uh, that we can add to this list, namely literature, filmmaking, and book and journal production. Uh, in the program, there's supposed to be a showing of one of the films that have arisen recently and which has attracted attention by winning uh, awards at home and abroad. And this would have been uh, Ariel Barbarona's Tupug Imatoy. But it's not going... Uh, they're screening it, but the filmmaker is not around. Okay. So you watch that and you get a good example of the kind of films, independent films, that Mindanao filmmakers are doing now. The years uh, covering uh, the late 1960s to early 1990s was perhaps the period when the movement to popularize a nationalist-oriented culture with progressive content and which tap into the rich indigenous cultures uh, that have reached this peak. But with the people power of the EDSA event in 1986, the consequent fragmentation among those advocating national liberation movement following the election debacle and the Operation Ahus, which was just Operation Weeding Out Suspected Deep Penetration Agents among the CPP NPA membership, as well as the rise of globalization, the advent of computer technology and information age, and the rise of the millennial generation, all of this have led to activism in all fronts taking a news dive. So also the ranks of cultural workers whose numbers have dissipated as they grow older and needing to settle down with only a few second, line, second liners taking their place. Funds have also become very scarce as funding agencies moved out of the Philippines and many NGO cultural instit institutions have folded. But there's still a few brave souls who persist to keep the flame burning. And it is perhaps the visual artists who are able to sustain the momentum of producing works that are still anchored in indigenous cultures. Because songwriters, very, very few, they haven't even come up with a Mindanao produced album lately. In terms of the theater scene, it's very dismal as most community-based groups are not anymore mounting plays. The only ones that do so are those that are university-based. Many others are content with just mounting musical production, showcasing indigenous dances and music in hotels, in bars, or when state and academic institutions have special occasions. In the contemporary era, however, there are promising initiatives in terms of literature, book production, and filmmaking. Lately, a group of writers producing poems, short stories, and essays are creating waves across Mindanao, especially those around the Iligan, Cagayan, the Oro area, and Dabao regions, led by those attending creative writing workshops. 
Well, most still write in English. There's a great number writing in Cebuano, Bisaya. Their writings have found their way beyond campus publications as local papers and journals are publishing their works. And publication of anthologies and book and journal publications are also appearing. And possibly we can also say that most of these still cover more on Lumad histories and ethnographies. And as we said here already, uh, there are other areas, there are other gaps that need to be filled in, like studies on the peasant migrant settlers. Mindanao has produced a few filmmakers, some of whom have already attracted national and international attention. We have mentioned that already. A further boast of Mindanao's cultural legacy has been the interest on the part of local government units to promote tourism through festivals like Davao's Kadayawan, Malaybalay's Kaamulan, and Butuan's Balanghai Festival. Practically every major cities and towns have their own festivals showcasing the cultures of their specific areas. As this would take a few days, uh, there's a number of things, and one is beauty contest, and Shell had already presented her paper on this. This have helped promote consciousness and appreciation of local indigenous cultures as they draw huge crowds to these exhibits and events. But uh, even then, uh, there is really a very good uh, possibility and a, a certain need for cultural workers and researchers to do a critique of most of these festivals. And lastly, and uh, I was following, I'm just following on Palm's report uh, paper this uh, afternoon, the state's National Museum tries to do its best to have cultural exhibits, but these are still mainly in Manila, although there are initiatives in the provinces, and as uh, Pam already indicated, it's a growing number. Few cities now have their own museums worth exploring, like Dabao, Mati, Kedapao, and Cotabato, Cagayan de Oro. Their own outreach, however, is limited to the middle class. So I end by saying that in all of this, from museum to literature to films to theater, the entire field of popular culture. Much work needs to be done so that the grassroots, the actual communities from where many of these stories are arising from, would be able to deepen their understanding of Mindanao as a living cultural landscape. Thank you very much. Good afternoon. Um, maybe field questions from here. Any questions for any of our speakers before we go out for coffee? <laughs> um. You can go up here. You can just stand up. 